institutionalized anti-Israel bias, but um, it's 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 the effort that we're trying to, you know, make a change. Right. Important that the effort's there, that you're not by yourselves. And and with that, Jonah kind of actually mentioned in passing in, in one of his remarks, um, one of the, our guests asked the question that so many of these students are, are unformed and especially as they're entering university, they're not prepared to defend themselves as Jews, as Zionists, um, supporters of Israel. So how do we reach out to the freshmen, the first years, you know, to kind of let them know that the way things are being perceived in the newspaper or the events or the clubs as you're hearing isn't the isn't the majority consensus. It's what it's it's what a lot of uh, minorities, fringe groups have kind of taken over and have taken over those leadership positions. So how do how do we reach those students so that they know that it's safe to come to your university and and you have support if you don't share that opinion? Jonah. Well, first we need to tell them that Zionism is not a dirty word. Uh, I can't tell you how many students I've met at Hillel, for example, I'm very involved in Hillel and McGill, who, you know, come up to me and they're like, yeah, I'm Jewish, but I'm not a Zionist, right? <laughs> you know, it's kind of a dirty word. People don't want to be associated with it because that it's a social phenomenon, you know? I mean, it's what's trending on TikTok, God forbid, <laughs> on Instagram, on, you know, on all these uh you know different media platforms that's what people think zionism is something ugly something uh you know dangerous um and like i said i mean it's not monolithic there are, i mean look I, this is not the place to get into the you know the history and the complexity of zionism but uh i think people completely forget that uh and it's important to tell first years that you know it's not simple as a graphic on instagram it's not as simple as you know just uh you know that uh, Jews have right to the, you know, land of Israel. I mean, it is that, but there's history behind that, right? There's context behind that. Um, I mean, it shouldn't require a poli sci education to, you know, <laughs> uh, talk about it, but unfortunately, it often feels like it does because any conversation about it becomes, you know, a full-fledged debate. Uh, and I think uh, more and more people need to, you know, learn uh, how to engage in those conversations. Um, but more than anything, to uh, emphasize how nuanced uh, this conversation is, how complex it is, uh, why they should be skeptical of atomizing ideologies, uh, you know, Marxist-Leninist <laughs> uh, ideas of, you know, oh, Israel it is the, you know, the more powerful, uh, you know, entity in this debate, therefore it's evil. You know, I see that on McGill's campus a lot. Uh, and it's just, I mean, why? <laughs> You're not giving any defense. There, there's no argument there. It's just statements that have no backing. I will also, if I may add, I think it's important, of course, to make that known to first year students in college, but I really do think that the education has to start much younger. And I don't know what exactly the education landscape looks like in England or in Canada. I can only really speak to the US having gone through Jewish day school. But I think Israel education isn't necessarily where it should be. And so when people come to campus and they think Zionism, let's say, is a dirty word or they're afraid to be pro-Israel, I think there is some validity to it, you know, as I've seen on campus, like there really is anti-Israel and anti-Semitism pervasive. But I think the larger issue is that people come and even if they are and identifying as pro-Israel and they grew up with a love of Israel, they, many at least, don't necessarily know why. They don't know the history. They don't know the complexity of the political conversations. And so they know that they can't necessarily hold an argument with someone. And because of that, they sort of shirk away from having those conversations and maybe don't want to say that they're a Zionist. And so I really do think that the education has to start far before someone steps on campus as far as Israel education and understanding of the conflict goes and an understanding of what it means to be pro-Israel because you really do have to fight because the conversation often doesn't start with, let's talk about the nuances, it's should Israel even exist? And for someone to have the ability to engage in a conversation like that, they really do need to have the facts. Uh, and that's why I think it has to really start much earlier and much younger. And that's more of a day school education issue than I think a college issue. Thanks, Alexandra. Thank you. Thank you, Jonah. Um, how can we, one of our one of our guests asked, how can we establish more clarity and fairness for Israel and Jews through journalism on campus? 
Is it going through the administration, the faculty advisors? Is it just student public opinion creating maybe even new newspapers or, or getting your own magazines out there? What, what is the way to go to, to reach the broader um, student population? Jonah? Well, <laughs> it's two things. I think people are talking about it too much. Um, <laughs> just straight up, I think the fact that Israel is brought up in just about every conversation about um, human rights um, in any college classroom, and I speak from experience, I mean, I've taken history, poli-sci classes that nothing to do with Israel, and somehow Israel comes up. Um, so I think that's part of it. Um, it's also, uh, to talk about human rights, the politicization of human rights. It's uh, the fact that, uh, you know, somehow the fact that Israel has, you know, done something in the past, or, you know, uh, you can find examples of things, it's, you know, it, it's original sin is, you know, it's born in blood. Um, and I think that uh, we need to be able to look at uh, history and at, you know, uh, these problems in a much more complicated and uh, nuanced way, like I said. Mm -hmm. How universal is this? You know, we have you're all representing Canada, the US and the UK, but I guess how bad is it? Are there examples of university campus media that remain balanced with regard to Zionism in Israel? You know, at the very least are showing both sides, both positions. If you're pro-Israeli, you'll get published. And also if you're against Israel, you'll get published. Like, are there, from what you've heard of, from, what, from your friends, what you read about in the media, I mean, I will say that at Princeton, the Daily Princetonian will publish pro-Israel pieces. They will. I mean, mm -hmm. the comment section will could be, you know, very heinous and difficult to read, in, you know, in response to the piece. And there's always a qualification of, you know, X is, you know, a former member of Tigers for Israel or a former vice president. And they'll always make sure to tie it to the Jewish community to show this is what this side is saying. And this implicit understanding that not all sides agree with this, this isn't the mainstream point of view, mm -hmm. sort of what Jonah was discussing earlier about the qualifications. So I don't necessarily think that it's always an issue of censorship, but sort of like I discussed, you know, I covered the same event as the Daily Princetonian did, but the coverage looked very, very different. And so I think that can be the most insidious because it may seem like on the surface there is this fair and balanced coverage, but in reality, it really doesn't exist. And so I don't know what's worse, but I think both are very dangerous. Right. Um, it's an interesting point. I mean, I can say from my own experience with working with students, there are newspapers like King's College London, The War, that didn't want to publish anything that put really SJP connecting them to anti-Semitism, but then a different article, they really address the um, problematic event that they have Omar Barghouti, how extremist it was, and, and it's the anti-Semitic movement of the BDS um, campaign, the anti-Semitic ideology behind it. So in some cases, it may be also the newspaper feeling intimidated um, by the anti-Israel organizations and not having their own agenda-driven uh, or reasons for not publishing. It's something to think about from, from a different point of, from a different angle. Um, so with that, I think I would like to, to take my, ask a, a final question to all three of you. Um, and before I do so, I just want to express to, our, to all of you and to everyone listening, how deeply we appreciate and respect your com commitment to journalistic integrity. It's really because of you young journalists and others like you that we have hope for the future of journalism because it is a sincere concern that we have in the university setting as well as in mainstream um, outlets nationally and internationally. So with that, I ask if all of you can take a minute to share some advice with the many aspiring journalists on this call concerning what they can do to keep moving forward and pushing against the stifling of their speech at their universities. And um, Alexander, we'll start with you, if you don't mind. Sure. I mean, I think just to, to keep going and to not shy away from publishing what you believe, but I think one addendum to that would be to make certain that you really do have the facts on your side and not to let it be emotionally driven. Because I know with myself, when I went to all of those events, as, you know, as a Zionist and as someone who's very connected to 
my Jewish identity, my first go-to emotion was certainly anger. And so I think the first draft of some of my pieces looked very different than the final ones that actually ended up published. Um, and so I think it's important to let the facts drive your reporting because they will speak for themselves. Um, but overall, really just to keep going. And if you see something that you think seems unjust, that you think Israel is being covered unfairly, really to make sure that it gets known because sometimes all of these issues you know, get buried. And then people think that that's just the mainstream point of view and to be anti-Israel is just the norm. And I think that's the direction we're headed in as a society. And I really do believe that young journalists can have a hand in making sure that that's not the trend. Thank you. Jonah? I would say to avoid buzzwords, avoid talking points, write something that the editors haven't seen before. I think that's the key to getting published, especially on such a controversial and you know hush hush topic as Zionism. If it's something that uh, the newspaper hasn't you know had to contend with before, if it isn't you know the usual Israel talking points like oh well uh, we created uh, you know what uh, baby tomatoes right those tiny tomatoes you know what I'm saying <laughs> uh, if it isn't just that uh, if it's you know really well reasoned and sort of uh, maybe not even profound, but just, you know, sort of unusual argument um, that is persuasive, uh, I think of a much better chance of, uh, you know, actually changing some minds and getting published. I think that's really important. Thank you, Jonah. And, and Abigail? I think what's been intimidating for me more generally um, with Israel activism is being able to speak and get my point across and like be heard. And um, I'm sure that there are people in this call who understand that when you are engaging in is like activism for Israel, it's sometimes like speaking to a brick wall. Like you can't um, change a person's mind, um, despite like even having uh, the facts by your side. And so I think what has been encouraging, at least with writing and uh, publishing pieces, is that um, though you may not change the minds of some people. Uh, it's the people who are neutral in this um, in the Israel-Palestine conflict, people who are open-minded. You always have the potential when you're writing and putting something out there um, through your activism to speak to, to people who are part of neither side and be heard. So I definitely think it's not a lost cause, even if, you know, you're on a university campus that um, that is appearing not to be on your side. I think it's always like worth um, trying to speak out to as broad an audience as possible. Thank you, thank you, thank you really much. It was excellent advice that you you provided to everyone. Uh, I think that's really important for students, young professionals, many people to hear. You never know who's there, who can support you, who's on your side. You just kind of got to speak up, <laughs> whether it's just saying something or writing something or sending a comment to, to a friend. Uh, once you do, it can be hard to be that first person, but it's 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 necessary. And we really appreciate all of your commitment to the truth, to standing up for Israel, to supporting the, the many Zionists um, out there. Um, and really call to all of you. Thank you really much. Thank you very much for your activism. And with that, I'm going to hand it over now to Combat Antisemitism's Editor-in-Chief, Barney Breen Portnoy. There we go. I'm unmuted. All right. Good. Good. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Aviva. Uh, thank you, Alexandra, Jonah, uh, Abigail, for that, that really fascinating conversation. Um, my name is Barney Breen Pornoy. I'm the Israel-based editor in chief for the Combat Anti-Semitism Movement. And um, as a former campus journalist myself at the University of Virginia, a decade and a half ago, as well as a former professional professional reporter, it was truly very interesting to hear all your insights and experiences. Um, in my role at CAM, I oversee the content we produce on our website and other media channels. We always want to highlight stories of students facing anti-Semitism on campuses across the world. So please feel free to reach out to us anytime you're looking for a platform to have your voice heard, which is so important. Um, and now in the spirit of this mission, I have the pleasure of announcing the launch of a new campus media contest organized by CAM, Camera on Campus, uh, ACT.IL, Hasbro Fellowships, and the Tikva Fund. Um, you and your fellow students are invited to submit articles to be reviewed by a, a selection committee 
on a rolling basis over the fall semester, and the committee will provide feedback before you seek media publication. Uh, articles may cover a range of topics, from speaking out against anti-Semitism, to sharing a personal story about your connection to Israel, to refuting anti-Zionist propaganda that you hear uh, you know, from your peers. You know, entrants whose articles who are, that, that are approved by the committee will receive $100. Approved articles that are then published by a local, national, or international media outlet will earn $250. And approved articles that are published by a campus media outlet will merit a total award of $350, or up to $350. Um, select articles may also be republished on CAM's website, um, commonantisemism.org, and the Camera on Campus blog. Um, for more information and to submit your articles, please visit uh, campusmedia.combatantisemitism.org. You know, thank you. Good luck. We look forward to, you know, we do look forward to reading the, the impactful work, the impactful pieces we, we sh we're sure that you'll produce. Um, so now, you know, there was a truly great start to this program, but we, you know, we've come, we, we've concluded the panel discussion portion of today's program. So for members of the general community who have joined us, thank you for tuning in. We hope to see you again at future events. And to the college students in our audience here, we are, um, we're now gonna take a short break and please return and please rejoin us at 2.15 PM US Eastern time. Um, for the start of the interactive workshop led by Times of Israel founding editor David Horowitz. Um, we will see you then. Bye for now. Thank you for joining us for exposing the threat of anti-Semitism in campus media. My name is Nelson France, and I serve as Director of Partnerships and Development for the Combat Anti-Semitism Movement, CAM. This writing workshop will teach you how to make your voice heard, what editors are looking for in op-ed submissions, common mistakes amateur writers make, best practices for pitching an article, the importance of writing and trying again if your first pitch isn't accepted or your first article isn't published. Our featured speaker is Mr. David Horowitz, founding editor of the online newspaper, The Times of Israel. He was previously the editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post, Israel's English language daily, before stepping down in July 2011 after almost seven years, an editor and publisher of the award-winning magazine, The Jerusalem Report. In his writing and lectures, Horowitz often seeks to promote intra-Jewish tolerance and to urge the Israeli leadership to devote more attention to the struggle for Israeli legitimacy on the second battlefield, in the media, the legal arena, and diplomatic forums. He gave a warmly received address on the subject at the 2009 Herzliya Conference. Horowitz has written from Israel for newspapers from around the world, including the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Irish Times, and the Independent of London. He's a frequent interviewee on CNN, the BBC, Sky, Fox News, NPR, and other TV and radio stations. Horowitz lectures widely in Israel, the United States, and Europe on Israeli current affairs, regularly giving the introductory briefings on Israel to congressional delegations brought 
to Israel from the United States. He has conducted landmark interviews with a succession of Israeli and international figures, including all of Israel's recent prime ministers, Presidents Barack Obama when he visited Israel as a candidate in 2008, and George Bush, as well as Tony Blair, Vladimir Putin, and to the particular delight of his children, Sir Paul McCartney. Harvitz is the author of 2004's Still Life with Bombers, Israel in the Age of Terrorism, and the 2000's A Little Too Close to God, The Thrills and Panic of a Life in Israel, both published in the U.S. He edited and co-wrote the Jerusalem Report's 1996 biography of Yitzhak Rabin, titled Shalom Friend, which was published in 12 countries and won the U.S. National Jewish Book Award for Nonfiction. He was the recipient of 2005's JDC Award for Journalism on Israel and Diaspora Affairs as a previous winner of the B'nai B'rith World Center Award for Journalism. A graduate of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, he was profiled in the university's 90th anniversary president's report as the graduate who had most impacted Israel's reality in the field of media. This was alongside Jarit Benish of the judiciary and Yuval Steinitz of the legislature, and as well as other uh, Israeli luminaries. Horvitz immigrated to Israel from London in 1983 and did his army reserve service in the educational corps. He's married to Lisa and they have three wonderful children. Following this upcoming Shark Tank workshop, we will have ample time for questions from the audience. So if you have questions uh, for, for Mr. David Horvitz, um, for our student panelists, please type them in the chat or use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and with that, it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator for this writing workshop, uh, who will be speaking after David. Uh, and this is Douglas Sandoval. Douglas is the managing editor of Camera on Campus, a uh, writer and public speaker. Douglas is a graduate of Fuller Seminary in Pasadena, California. His passion for Zionism is deeply influenced by his inner city upbringing, interest in philosophy and religion, and his many, many trips to Israel. Uh, with that, David, please take it away. And again, thank you for being with us to help us to expose the threat of anti-Semitism in campus media, but most importantly, to activate this network of students from around the world. Thanks, Nelson, and hi to Douglas as well, and hi to everybody, and I'm um, very pleased to be doing this, and I hope it's gonna be helpful. Um, there's really a lot of background and context that I'm crying out to say to you. Um, and I'll, 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 I'll keep it to a minimum before I get on to what you actually wanted me to talk about, which are things like how to write smart op-eds and, and try and get them published. Um, I was listening to the last uh, panel and uh, Jonah said at one point that it shouldn't require a political science education to kind of understand what's going on with Israel. Um, but of course it does require uh, at least a readiness um, to look a little more deeply and to um, expose yourself to complicated narratives. Uh, and in a way that's what we're kind of gonna be grappling with in this session, uh, bringing a point of view that uh, people may not be aware of. I think there's an incredible amount of ignorance uh, about Israel and especially in this context about Israel and, uh, and, and the region and, and the conflicts and challenges that it faces. And I think it's worth bearing in mind just as a starting point, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're wanting to, to weigh in and, and have something that you think that it's important to say and, and that, an argument that you strongly believe in, uh, it may be very difficult to convince people who are closed minded and who are not are not interested in hearing arguments that conflict with theirs. Uh, your challenge really, you know, if, if the challenge is to win those people over, it's a very, very uphill battle. But there are lots of people who are um, who know who are open at least uh, um, to intelligent arguments uh, who have whose whose worldviews evolve, who are honest with themselves, um, who can be won over by powerful arguments, by uh, um, coherent arguments and so on. You know, I think some of the building blocks for almost all of these arguments are not widely known. Uh, and therefore I, I am gonna do this little pre-digression. Uh, I think a lot of people don't know that uh, Israel is the only place on earth where the Jewish nation was ever sovereign never willingly left, always prayed to return. And that uh, the Jewish nation was sustained in exile uh, around the religion until uh, we were able to revive our homeland. 
I think people think that because Israel makes so much news and uh, again, a focus of, of, of these sessions, because Israel is so obsessively highlighted in, in, in some of the context that we're dealing with now, people think it's territorially vast. And when you have things like the Daily Show showing a tiny Gaza and then pulling out to a much bigger Israel, but neglecting to pull the camera back even further and show how tiny Israel is on a map of the Middle East, I think people think Israel is huge. I really do. Um, just for, for the purpose of arguments that you may make one day, we're the size of New Jersey. We fit into Florida eight times. We fit into Texas more than 30 times. I don't think people know that. I think a lot of people don't know that Israel was, was revived on the basis of a UN resolution in 1947, on the basis of a revived Jewish homeland and what would have been a first ever state for the Arab residents of this part of the world, but it was rejected by the neighborhood. And therefore, historical context, I mean, you can go back and back and forward and forward and choose where to begin an argument and so on. But some of the basic historical context I don't think is, is widely appreciated. And I think it's really important. I think it's worth highlighting that Israel was revived too late to, save as, to serve as a refuge for the Jews of, of Europe from the Holocaust, but has been serving as a refuge ever since for Jews from the Middle East and North Africa who were not safe in their countries. And right up to recent years when we rescued Ethiopian Jews from civil war, and right now, where we're a refuge for Jews from Belarus and Russia and Ukraine. Uh, so, you know, there are lots of other contextual, of other crucial contextual pieces that I think in, in many contexts are worth highlighting and that one should not assume that one's audience knows and that remake the, the framework in which the whole debate plays out. So some of those points are important. There are many, many others too. On the Palestinian front, I think it can be argued, I mean, Israel has, maybe three imperatives that some Israeli Jews would want to maximize, shall we say. We want to be a Jewish state. We want to be a democratic state. And we feel that we have a historic and biblical connection to territory that is outside sovereign Israel. But we can't have all three. If we were to claim sovereignty everywhere through the, between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, we would either lose our Jewish majority or we'd have to somehow subvert our democracy. And therefore, there is a willingness for compromise on the part of many Israelis, because we want to maintain a Jewish and a democratic Israel. But it's complicated. And it's complicated in part because when we have relinquished territory, territory that we captured in a war where we preempted an attack intended to destroy us, when we have relinquished territory recently, we've been attacked from it. So we left southern Lebanon, by the way. Hezbollah took over. That was in 2000. We left Gaza in 2005. Hamas took over and has engaged in relentless conflict with Israel. And if Hamas controlled the West Bank, all of Israel would be paralyzed because all of Israel would, would be within rudimentary rocket range of pretty much everywhere in the West Bank. And just to give that a very personal context that many of you can relate to, a single rocket fired from Gaza, I believe it was in 2014, landed a mile from Ben Gurion Airport. And for two days, two thirds of the world's airlines, including all the major American carriers, stopped flying to Israel because of one rocket landed not, not in the airport, did not cause damage to life or limb. Because of that, two thirds of the world's airlines stopped flying to Israel. Imagine what would happen if Hamas, the people with the rockets, were taking over in the West Bank. And therefore the notion that uh, simply relinquishing the territory would guarantee us peace, the evidence in recent years has told us the opposite. And therefore, again, it's complicated. And one last thing that I wanna say before I get into the nitty gritty, which is, Israeli Zionists are all over the spectrum, right? There are Israeli Zionists, passionate Zionists, uh, who, who, uh, who, who believe that we should annex Judea and Samaria, the biblical Judea and Samaria, and there are passionate Zionists who believe we should pull back to the pre-67 lines tomorrow. And when you're deciding that you need to weigh in, that you have something to say, you need to decide what, 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 it, what, it, what an Israel view you want to champion, what you are comfortable with, what you believe in, what you are able to defend. And, and to make sure that you have your facts straight and that you can defend them. In terms of writing op-eds well and getting them published and so on, what can I tell you? Um, there's no magic formula for a, spa, a smart op-ed opinion piece. I think you, you have to grab the attention of the commissioning editor, of the people who are gonna decide whether to publish or not. And you wanna hold the reader's attention through to the end. You need to have your facts right. I mean, some of this is pretty basic, but important to stress. You need to make clear and cogent points. 
and you need to back them up. It's not enough to make a statement, even if it's factually true. I, I need to, to, to know why I should believe what you're telling me. I would say, and I think this was mentioned in the previous panel as well, uh, towards the end, and it's important. Uh, you've got to tell me something you know, that I didn't know before. Or at the very least, you've got to look at something familiar in a fresh way. So in a way, I'm saying you've, you've got to add something to, to the sum of our knowledge, to the debate, not simply hammer away at a, at a view that is out there or at a subject that is out there in exactly the same way that it's already being uh, debated or reported. I think you've got to write for the non-expert reader. And this comes back to what I said at the very beginning about there are people you're not going to be able to win over, but there are lots of people who are open. Um, to, to a coherent, intelligent, fascinating argument. So I don't think that means dumbing down what you're saying, but bear in mind, presumably you have expertise, otherwise you wouldn't be writing. But your, your uh, mission is not to um, make people aware of how smart and well-informed you are, it's to persuade people of a view that you think it's important, that they at least listen to and maybe even come to endorse. So that doesn't require dumbing down, but it does re require writing in an accessible way. Right. So, you know, I'm sure, you know, you're, you're all incredibly erudite and, and have um, impressive vocabularies. And I'm guilty of this myself, believe me. Um, that doesn't mean you need to, to, to use the, the, the longest word. Use the, the word that, you, that conveys the message and that you're sure people will, will understand. Uh, in terms of length, we, you know, I'll get into some of the practicalities in a minute. In a minute but short is often sweet. Uh, the, uh, our experience... In, certainly at the times of Israel, very often cogent, brief articles, news and opinion uh, can be much more effective than uh, a piece that's made its point and then belabors it and doesn't take it anywhere further forward and then loses the readers because it became repetitive or it became dull. Um, and when you get to the end of this piece, end well. You know, Imagine yourself, think of how you consume material that's printed uh, the final sentences or the final graph, if it circles back to the to the top and it makes and it makes a slightly stronger or a slightly different point that kind of links the whole article together, or it ends with a flourish, great. Don't don't trail off into some you know repeat repetition of what you'd said earlier in the piece. Now, what I was really struck by in the last panel um, was that lots of the things that I've talked about now may not matter at all. Uh, if you are trying to publish in campus publications that are not uh, weighing your articles on their merits. And maybe we should discuss that a little bit more later on. Uh, but in terms of at least giving yourself a, sh a shot uh, at publication with people who are uh, prepared to weigh submissions on their merits, um, a few points, um, and they're not in a, necessarily in the right order. Um, if I'm a commissioning editor and you're sending a full article to me, then you've got to grab me with an intriguing headline. Remember, when people consume written material, even, you know, whether it's um, uh, a news article, an opinion piece or whatever, the first thing you read is the headline. If it's relevant, the, the next thing you'll notice is the picture or the illustration or maybe the other way around and then the lead paragraph and so on. So, you know, don't announce that you're going to tell me something. Tell me something, whether it's in the headline or, or the very beginning of the pitch. Like I said, a strong photo if it's relevant. I don't know how much that is going to be relevant in certain campus newspapers. Really, really important if you are attaching illustrations, we're in the practicalities here, make sure that you have the right to those, to those uh, illustrations or photographs. In other words, that if a campus newspaper or online site uses the photo or illustration that you have submitted with your piece, that they won't find themselves um, being asked to pay for it by an originator because you didn't have the rights to it. So that's pretty important uh, mechanics wise. Do some of the basics like checking what word word limits are if there are some you know if they if they don't if, if the limit for a piece is 800 words don't send a, a commissioning editor 900 words you, you, you've harmed your chances uh, there and then copy edit and proofread again this this is basic stuff but it really matters if, if i'm a uh, if i'm looking at lots and lots of submissions and the subject line has a typo in it uh, your name's not on it somewhere clearly it doesn't say who you are some some of the basics and there are typos in the piece you know, I'm, I'm less inclined to, to, to take it forward. And by the way, if there are typos and poor grammar and poor writing in the piece, it, it undermines everything about what you're trying to do. Again, I would have thought this is pretty obvious, but worth stating. Clearly identify yourself 
in, in the in the piece if you're pitching the piece or, or, or if, you're, if you're giving the whole piece or in the pitch if you're making a pitch by which i mean who are you what qualification do you have it's if relevant to write this piece what would they need to know about you you know don't make them have to chase you up um in terms of of the mechanics of who to submit to okay is do you know who the editor of the of the section is do you know who the the relevant person is are you sure you've got the right email for them um, once you've made contact with them, um, how are you supposed to submit it? Is it in a file, in a format that they're comfortable working with? Uh, make sure that what you're trying to get published has a chance to get published by, by being addressed to the right person in the format. Now, I don't know, and, and you can tell me in, in the discussion that we can have from now on, I don't know how um, campus newspapers work, and I'm sure they don't all work in the same way. Uh, in other words, I don't know if they want an article or if they want a pitch. Uh, if they want an article, well, then you give them the article and you make it the best article that you can. If you want a pitch, then pitch to them effectively. Make sure you understand what they mean by a pitch. Usually it's, you know, two or three sentences or two or three graphs at the most. Um, but be careful about that. Make sure, make sure you know that you're doing the right thing. Again, compelling, fresh, thought-provoking, important. Why do you think it's important that it appear in that particular publication? That's something that I would say to a commissioning editor. Here's why I'm submitting this to you. Da, 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 da. In, in the case of the pieces we're going to consider shortly, it's pretty obvious why, but it may not always be obvious. So here I'm sending this to you guys because, and here, here's who I am, and this is why uh, um, I'm writing about it. Douglas, I'm getting near to the end, and then, then we'll take this uh, um, forward. Um, and when you're making that pitch, think about how you would explain what you're writing to a friend. In other words, sum up in normal terms what it is you're trying to write, what it is you're planning to write. Uh, if, if it's timely, that's better. If you're writing about something with a news peg, because something just happened, you're responding to something that happened, something's about to happen, that's very compelling for editors. Hey, there's an event. This is the reason I'm, I'm, I'm weighing in. And make sure it's not libelous, okay? A well-intentioned editor will not be happy if they publish something and it turns out that you were not on solid ground and worst of all, that you've you know libeled someone. So make sure you're on solid ground from that point of view if the editor is going to be subsequently pressured by critics and is going to come back to you and say, you wrote this, now we're getting all this trouble about it. You need to be able to say, of course, this is why I wrote it. Here's why I wrote it. Here's the basis on which I wrote it. Maybe even links if relevant. Okay, there's a, a lot of other stuff um, that I can I can add and we can take this forward, but maybe I'll stop there for now, Douglas, and then you take this forward as, as you wish, okay? Thank you. Uh, thank you, David, for uh, you know taking the time to be with us and also give us all this um, you know insightful uh, in, you know, these uh, insightful tips on best practices for publishing opinion editorials. Um, with us today, we have three exemplary students, Alex Berman, an advertising major at the University of Miami, who's also an accomplished songwriter, David Getter of Rice University, a history buff on a pre-law track, and Alex Grossman at the Ohio State University, an international studies in Russian and Russian major who speaks seven languages. Today, these three students will outline uh, their strategy to address a recent incident at the University of California, Berkeley. On August 21st, the student group Law Students for Justice in Palestine um, announced that nine st uh, student organizations at the campus law school adopted a pro-Palestine bylaw that affirmed that each group, each group will endorse the boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign um, by refusing to lend their platforms to Zionist speakers who, quote, support the Zionist project of genocide and apartheid, end quote. Alexandra, let's start with your pitch. Hi, it's great to be here today. Um, thank you for having me. So um, my pitch is the following. The BDS bylaw that law students for justice in Palestine, uh, Palestine LSJP, at Berkeley Law School are pushing is inherently anti-Semitic. By not providing a platform for speakers with opposing views, they are acting as an anti-Zionist bubble that is only disseminating propaganda that seeks to vilify the Jewish state. Furthermore, by, lab by labeling Israel as an apartheid state, LSJP is disregarding the fact that Arabs living in Israel have the same exact rights as Israelis. They can serve in the Knesset, vote and attend Israeli universities, among many other liberties not extended to Palestinians in other Middle Eastern countries. 
Furthermore, the primary intention of the BDS movement is not just to undermine, but rather to destroy a sovereign, secure, multi-ethnic country. As a result, LSJP is engaging in anti-Semitism, ma making it an unsafe and uncomfortable environment for Jewish students on campus, while simultaneously giving anti-Zionist individuals a platform to spew their hateful rhetoric. Thank you, Alexandra. David, do you have any thoughts on Alexandra's pitch? Um, sure. So, and I'm and I'm directing this to Alex and uh, maybe to you as well, Douglas. Um, so, Alex, you you heard about the 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 um, the move on Berkeley? How? How did you hear about this? Um, I actually um, was sent it um, for this. Um, like for it was an article that was I think published in. Um, I honestly forget which. Uh, yeah, Daily like, yeah, but it was um yeah it was a uh an article and so I read it and then um kind of formulated my pitch based on the article that I read. Okay, it, do we know is it radically atypical what was done at Berkeley? Is it is it um one of a stream of similar um moves or or is it unique in its um reach and significance? Douglas, maybe you know this best, right? Well, I, I mean, I would just say that, and I think Alex has thoughts on this as well. Um, but you know, in in our experience, I mean, they're not people who proponents of the BDS campaign um, are. They don't hide the fact that they push policies of anti-normalization. Um, it is a part of their platform, um, and I know that Alex, um, you know, has encountered, you know, or seen in campuses in the periphery, maybe not at the University of Miami most recently. But in a periphery, uh, we made her aware and we've discussed uh, such activity on other campuses in her in her region. Alex, do you have any thoughts? Um, yeah, I definitely think this is like a trend not just occurring on, I mean, obviously for me, my personal experience at the University of Miami has been overall very positive, especially when I read about other campuses and my peers, especially in within uh, camera who have experienced a lot of anti-Zionism and a lot of um, like a chilling effect um, when trying to publish articles. Um, so I definitely think that it, it is a trend um, growing on campuses, um, which is definitely uh, very dangerous and alarming. Okay, what are your mechanics now? So let's say, you know, what I'm looking at is a, um, a two, three paragraph pitch, right? And that's because you know that the newspaper that you would hope would publish it, that's how they um, first look at material? Or, or what do you know about, who are you pitching it to and what do you know about what they want? Um, so for me, in terms of formulating this pitch, I wanted to pick out the main points um, that I read in the article that kind of stood out to me as like big kind of, um, I guess, arguments against Israel, the ones that I thought were a, a stronghold within the article um, and I would be pitching this to um, if it were on my campus and I was just talk, talking about what happened on the Berkeley campus it would be like to my university newspaper. Oh, in this case it's to the it's, but that's not who you're pitching this to or that is who you're pitching this to your no, university the, paper or, or the Berkeley paper? Um, this would be to the Berkeley paper in this case. Okay, and we and we know what do we know about their um, editorial um, procedures, both practically and ideologically. Um, I mean, I don't know in terms of that newspaper specifically in their history, but I think, um, I think, I guess, in the past few years, I think they have been primarily um, more. Uh, I guess, critical towards Israel and publishing and getting like Israel uh, articles that are may maybe pro-Israel um, published. Douglas, you want to weigh in and, and add anything to that? Because maybe you have some direct experience or, or wisdom. Um, sure. Well, you know, I think, you know, also uh, an angle that we, we, you know, we we encourage the students, um, you know, that are on this on this workshop um, is to you know is to say they were pitching it to within um, to within the Jewish and pro-Israel community. So um, yes, you know if Alex were theoretically a student at the at 
Cal at the University University of California Berkeley, uh, she would most certainly pitch it to the Daily Cal. Um, but you know, raising awareness about these issues also stands to make an impact. And so um, I think you know the, the this pitch could also say go to a paper like the Times of Times of Israel or the Algeminer or JNS or another comparable outlet. Um, and so uh, I would just like to state that just because I, to add, add a little bit of clarity. Um, but I think for the most part, um, Alex is dead on in saying that, you know, that the Daily Cal has been, at least over the last few years, most recently, um, you know, quite uh, um, difficult when it comes to publishing these sort of views. They, they uh, typically will only report uh, typically on the, on the, on the, you know, anti-Zionist side and not really represent the views of other students, including uh, namely Zionist and pro-Israel student, uh, pro-Israel voices on campus. Um, and so that um, would more succinctly answer your question. Okay. I, I mean, I think, you know, you, you've got some, some good points in there. Um, I'm struck by the, uh, the point towards the end, um, which uh, about it, it, it becoming uh, an unsafe and uncomfortable environment for Jewish students on campus. I think that's a, a, an interesting point. I mean, the, the the previous graph or two is arguing the um, the, the the dismerits of their uh, representation of Israel, uh, which is um, you know a, an important argument to make, but it's not the it's not the one that um, that has a direct impact on day to day life for people on campus in the way that that final argument that you make is I think that's a really important argument uh, I think if, if I'm uh, um, in a campus environment and I have a credible student argument that says something that is being done um, is 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 a betrayal of, of our of what we ought to expect would be um, a, a tenable comfortable environment for us as students that's a moving argument I'm not saying the other arguments aren't, but uh, it takes the it takes the piece from the from a political science battle, a very passionate one, by the way, to one that directly affects life on campus. And I think that's a really important one. Um, I'm not I'm not suggesting you reorganize the the pitch. I don't think that's the point. But when you do make write the 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 finished article and um, wherever it's being published, I think that's a really important point to make. You know, life on campus becomes harder for us because. Um, something that we have every right to identify with and support is being branded beyond the pale, uh, and we are we are being made to feel um, beyond the pale ourselves for having that view. Um, there's intolerance here, and things that that go to the heart of of what is meant to be uh, a free thinking university environment. I would be, you know, I'd be moved by that, um, and I feel pers a sort of sense of personal responsibility as a newspaper. Um, that uh, that sense of personal responsibility that you wouldn't feel necessarily over a back and forth political argument um, wherever you were on that spectrum. I think that's a really important point to make. Thank, Thank you, David. You so much. Any any final thoughts, Alex? Um, I think yeah. I really did want to tie it back to the campus um, community and really show that these these um, like I guess political actions on campus aren't just political, like they're creating an unsafe environment for Jewish students. So I really appreciate your feedback. Thank you, David. Excellent. All right, let's move on to David Getter from Rice University. David? Yeah, hi, how are you? Um, thanks for having me. So uh, I'm gonna present my pitch, my pitch and then uh, also uh, get some feedback, hopefully from, uh, from Mr. Horowitz. So uh, my pitch is uh, the campaign by the Students for Justice in Palestine chapter at Berkeley Law School for the widespread adoption of a BDS bylaw. It's just the most recent example of SJP's hackneyed practice of steeping its anti-Semitic activity in the language of social justice in an effort to disguise as activism the age-old hatred that is at the core of its ethos. The anti-Semitism inherent in the campaign's objective, the delegitimization of the world's only Jewish state, is matched only by the censoriousness of the prescribed means of achieving it. Abandoning all pretense of open-mindedness, the bylaw, which commits the adopting organizations to not inviting speakers who, quote, have expressed and continue to hold views in support of Zionism, the apartheid state of Israel, and the occupation of Palestine, end quote, 
represents a brazen attack on free speech at an institution whose efficacy is uniquely contingent on it. Unlike the anti-Semitic canard of Israel as a bastion of colonialism, imperialism, and other types of oppression, which it at least attempts to package under the more palatable label of anti-Zionism, LSJP is utterly unapologetic in its rejection of free speech. All right, so David, I had a bit of a problem with your with your last sentence. It's a very long sentence. Oh, it's not. It's broken into two. The last sentence there, because I thought it kind of re read as though you were giving them a break about something that was pretty awful. Because what they because something else was even worse, um, right? Is that is that did I read that right? Um, no, yeah, yeah. I um, I didn't mean it to come across like that. Like, not that they should be let off the hook for the anti-Semitism just because there's this other issue of um, free speech. It was more that like my I was going to be addressing it from the angle of free speech. And so like I just wanted to emphasize off the top that um, anti-Semitism is obviously a, a big issue in in what they did. But um, I, like I also want to stress the gravity of the th like the threat to free speech as well. So I, I would I would re-examine that sentence. I think you you can make the point um, without allowing them to think that you're conceding something that you're not conceding, right? Um, so I don't think you you need to sort of give a little to get them on the free speech thing. So I would I would re remake that. I'm uh, you know I, I I would encourage you, and I'm sure you will do this in a full piece. You know the notion that BDS, which purports to be um, dedicated to ending Israel's um, control over the Palestinians, the argument that in fact it's an effort to destroy Israel altogether, which I happen to um, believe, uh, you've got to back that up somehow, and I'm sure you will in a longer piece. You know, if you're going to argue that this is not just about uh, encouraging Israel to um, to withdraw to pre-67 lines, but BDS and, and this iteration of it is, is aimed to harm and ultimately destroy Israel, um, I want to see why that's a credible argument, again, which I think it is, by the way. I think you've got to make it. And another thing that I'm struck about on on um, on all three, and I, I looked at the third piece as well, which we'll come to, um, a point that I think you know any piece on this should make is, for goodness sake, this is um, a university environment. This is an academic environment. Ac academia is, is at least, it's meant to be about expanding knowledge. It certainly needs to be about questioning information and um, being open to information that you might not be aware of and you might not even like. Um, the notion that um, any kind of, of, in a university environment, you would totally shut down people's capacity to bring forward uh, any other argument, is, it, is, it is the antithesis of, of what universities are there for. That's one point that I think is really important to make. And another point that I think is really important to make or worth making, and you may choose to or, or not, you know, are the people you're up against so, is their argument so weak and so indefensible that they cannot afford to let anybody have a crack at it, right? That's what they're saying. They're saying, hey, we've got a position and we're not going to let anybody else near us or any of the other clubs who have signed up for this, essentially because we will have a hard time knocking it down. I mean, that's the only conclusion you can draw. If your arguments are robust and you're solid in your beliefs, then surely you should be perfectly capable of countering uh, arguments rather than banning them and closing them down it is it is so uh, it, it's such an expression of weakness for their cause I, you know i don't think that's that's the argument that overturns the ban but i think that's an argument that's worth making um you're shutting down people why are you you know is is your uh, is is your narrative so fragile that it cannot uh, survive somebody else taking a different view Douglas, come back to us. David, anything else you wanted to say? Um, no, no I, I appreciate the, the feedback and uh, I definitely agree with, um, I think that's another important frame to use to, um, to argue this is to, you know, kind of show the connection between their unwillingness to um, entertain opposing views and, you know, the, the, the weakness of their their of their perspective um i mean they, they're carrying out the very policy that they falsely accuse israel of following right no free speech people constrained uh, not enjoying the same rights as others 
and now you're going to ban the people who have something that they want to say and who want the same rights that you have. You're going to stop them. It's a pretty, pretty hypocritical position to take, right? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, we see this all the time. In fact, the full quote says that they, they're doing this to, so that Palestinian students are not harmed on campus. So to, to add kind of, you know, further to further the point of, you know, that you're driving at, David, about hypocrisy, um, it's, you know, clearly they're, they're, they're holding, uh, they're holding, you know, Jewish students and Zionist voices to a double standard, um, which I think is, uh, which I think is fair here to, you know, I think David, uh, you know, David Getter's, you know, pitch, uh, I think illustrates well, but as you mentioned, I think it could be clearer, um, you know, how to, how to bring the free speech issue into, into the conversation. I think there's a, a more tactful way to do that. So I, I definitely agree with you there. Um, and last but not least, we have um, Alex Grossman uh, from The Ohio State University. Um, Alex, let's- Yeah, you, uh, let's you just start my camera, Douglas. There we go, awesome. Working on it. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm very honored to share my pitch. And mine focuses more on the response of the law dean um, who just in the article that was shared to us simply called the incident troubling. So, um, my pitch is as follows. The lukewarm response of Berkeley's law deans, a law school dean, Erwin Chemerinsky, to LSJP's BDS bylaw, which only worsens the anti-Semitic environment that has long persisted at Berkeley, is more than just troubling. The BDS law calls on all clubs that adopted to accept the position that Israel is a racist apartheid state and that they are not to host any speaker who supports the state of Israel or even the fact that Jews have the right to their own state given their con condemnation of Zionism. At the same university where swastikas were etched into cars, one of which belonged to a son of Holocaust survivors, Jewish students continue to feel endangered and are pressured to no longer participate in organizations which may be an equally important part of their identity as being Jewish, such as the Women of Color Collective and Queer Caucus, who also adopted the bylaw. Chemerinsky had no problem condemning 11 students who disrupted Israeli ambassador Michael Oren's speech when he visited UC Irvine, saying that, that their actions were not protected by the First Amendment. So where is Chemerinsky's condemnation of a policy that shuts down open dialogue across political beliefs? Although it is understandable that Chemerinsky desires to keep his Zionist beliefs out of campus politics, this is not a matter of being politically correct. It is a matter of making sure that Jews are not pressured out of enriching their extracurricular education simply due to their beliefs and that clubs remain a place for facilitative cross-political cross dialogue. Okay, Alex, so, you know, you, you do make, you also make the point about uh, the impact for students on campus. I think it's really, you know, I, I looked at the material that was sent to me before this, and um, I don't know the names of, of the nine, I think, um, clubs that uh, signed up for these, for these bylaws. But that's a really important point you make. That's something that has nothing to do with the issue that the particular uh, people behind the move are campaigning for gets caught up in it and therefore uh, becomes off, off limit for students for whom it is intended, right? That's why you know these 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 clubs are there and so on. So I think that's a really important point. Um, I, I just, you know, I, I want to move this a little bit and Douglas, be with us and anybody else who can weigh in. Uh, to help me, because the the our the panel before, which I assume all of you were were listening to, and some of you were participating in, so much of it, uh, or, or a lot of it, seemed to be um, reflecting a concern that you guys can write beautiful pieces, very very well reasoned and very well argued, and they won't be published in the places that you want them to be published, and that's you know that's an you know that that subverts everything that, that I'm on this call for in a way, right? Because I, you know, I'm I, I can happily try to tell you the things that I've told you about how to pitch effectively and how to write nicely and what matters and so on. But if if you're not in any kind of uh, environment that judges your pitches by their merits, um, ha, ha, the, the the challenge I think is how do we turn your wisdom and your coherent writing and your determination. Uh, how do we avoid it being a lost cause? Um, so I have some ideas, but I'd be I'd be interested. First of all, um, Alex, you go for it. How are you going to get this published if they don't want to publish it? Or what would you do if they don't want to publish it? And, and maybe so the other people who already pitched should weigh in as well after, after you. Right. So 
that's one thing I had in mind when I structured this pitch is that I didn't want it to be a whole argument based on what what Israel's doing and whether it's morally right or not. Because I know that at a school like Berkeley, which I knew before this article had a very um, aggressive environment towards Zionism, but that wasn't going to fly. So that's why I structured my article more on just how it excludes Jewish students, regardless of their political beliefs. Um, so it focuses more on anti-Semitism rather than an Israel Zionist argument. But if they were to still push back and say, we're not interested in publishing this, I think the most important thing to do is, uh, which is actually, as I've spoken with Douglas, a current situation I'm facing because I pitched an article to the Ohio State newspaper um, and they simply responded by saying, we're not interested in publishing at this time. So I respond by saying, uh, could you clarify please and give me exact reasons, parts of my article that you think um, why you're why you're not interested in it, and if you'd like me to make any changes. And I think as far as campus newspapers, in especially hostile environments, I think that's really as much as we can do to see if there's anything we can do to appeal to these editors by making edits um, and clarifying, you know, which parts of the article are what give you problems. I think that's, in my opinion, the most we can do um, as writers in a hostile environment. And if I if I can bring you know Alex Alex Berman you know also back into the conversation, we actually had a several month ordeal where we were you know we were working with the or reaching out to the paper at the University of Miami for the hurricane, um, you know for the same reason because she had sent an article in she never heard back, and she eventually got it published and I think holding the papers accountable. Um, and Alex can speak a little bit more about her experience with that. I don't want to take her opportunity away to answer the question, uh, but um, I do think that's a, a good, also another thing uh, that we can do. Alex? Yeah, so um, I think, honestly, in my experience, it was really difficult because overall, the University of Miami campus is, I would consider it to be pro-Israel. Um, and like we don't have an SJP, like it is a very warm environment um, for Jews um, and Zionists alike. Um, and I did go through months long or like a month long ordeal where I wasn't really receiving a response. And I just had to be persistent and get other people on my side. I reached out to um, the advisor of the Israel Club on my campus, um, which helped. but. It honestly just took a lot of persistence and um, and also just showing that it was a pressing issue. Um, <clears throat> and um, and yeah, I just it was definitely a very odd and bizarre experience and I didn't expect anything of the sort to happen, but um, I did get published ultimately, which was. Um, and, and briefly, what was the the situation that occasioned your piece and what did your piece say? So um, J Street held a screening of a film called Mission Hebron, um, and it really vilified the IDF, um, painted um, Israel in a horrible light, kind of disregarded um, Israel's ties to um, Hebron, and um, like the Jewish ties. And, um, and so they screened a film, and like the fact that they screened this film on campus, um, I felt was propagating misinformation to students. Um, so I kind of wrote uh, an op-ed on the film's inaccuracies um, and clearly pointed out like the various arguments that were inaccurate um, within the film. So, I mean, that, that takes us, I think, to a really important point, okay? First of all, um, you know, you don't give up if something isn't published um, and you use fair means to try and um, get it published. And you, you have so got to be, when you're, you know, when you're, uh, venturing into op-ed battle, you so have to be sure that you have all your um, that your facts are lined up, that you're on completely solid ground in everything you're saying. Um, because again, even even publication is not the end of the of the exercise. Um, as as you, a lot of you know, I think that afterwards people come under pressure to cut and remove and so on. Now I don't know the the movie and I don't know your piece. Um, but the principle is the principle. If you're gonna, if you feel that that an injustice has been done and that you've got um, important points to make that put things into a different context, don't give up and make sure that the points you're making are, are really solid. I, you know, 
writing hangs around and, and why are we having this conversation at all in an era of instant social media and um you know way past the, the the old days where what was written in black and white and you picked up in the morning was your only source of news i mean that is not the case right and yet we are having this conversation because there's something hardwired i assume maybe in a few generations it won't be there anymore but when you see something written down and it's there and it's not disappeared five seconds later because it was something somebody said um it's there eternally and it is eternally there online by the way even more so than daily newspapers ever were right it impacts people people take it seriously and therefore it's worth pursuing i i believe in it a great deal and it's really important that you're that you're you, you know your facts are right and you're on really solid ground because once it's out there it's out there excellent uh david getter do you have any um any thoughts regarding uh, uh mr harwood's question uh yeah i would say um in my experience the key is to just be really um, selective in the battles that you choose. I mean, I think a lot of times the tactic um, of a lot of campus papers is to draw out the editing process as long as possible to kind of just discourage you rather than, um, you know, explicitly rejecting your piece. They kind of want to, um, I don't know, make you, um, make you kind of give up um by making the process as as arduous as possible and so i think that it's important that you pick your battles in terms of the edits that they're trying to make because there may be some things that they're they're telling you you need to edit out this you need to source this this is um you know this is too um uh, aggressive or whatever it's your tone something and, and i think you need to really know when when to um when to fight back and when to accept their, you know, their edits, because um, a lot of times I think, um, you know, they're going to throw so many different edits at you, um, suggested edits that um, you, you, you know, you're going to have to take some of them. And it's important that you maintain a working relationship with them by not, um, by not pushing back on everything, only pushing back on the things that really matter and are central to to your message. And then also I would say like, um, it's important to know when it's time to move to a different um, publication. I mean, I, I had, I published a bunch of articles in my campus paper and it's varied year by year uh, as to how receptive they've been to um, opposing viewpoints or viewpoints that are divergent from the, the general campus consensus, or the general newspaper editorial board consensus. And so I think um, it's important to know if there's just an editorial board that's extremely hostile, you kind of need to recognize that and publish somewhere else. So I, I did that once. I, there was a piece I submitted that um, I could tell wasn't going to go anywhere. And so I kind of reversed course and got it published through an independent online blog. Um, and then there have been other times where um, you know, I, I know that the editorial board, the composition of the editorial board is such that they're going to be more receptive. And, you know, I have a friend who's on the editorial board and is willing to push for me. And and so I know it's worth, you know, worth the fight to to get it published. Um, and so I think it's important to know um, when to move on and when to keep fighting and make sure that you're fighting the right things. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, David Getter. I really appreciate you sharing. Um, uh, David Horowitz, do you have any thoughts on what the students have shared? Um, any, um, you know, anything that any insights um, from you as well as to what you recommend when students are confronted with a paper that's less than cooperative? Yeah. Um, so I mean, a few things. First of all, um, the, the previous hour and just the the reality that was being described here was um, sounds extremely challenging. It's not new. Uh, you probably gathered that, or you even heard, I grew up in London. I moved to Israel when I was 20. I went to Hebrew U. I didn't go to university in England. Um, but before I was a kid, so in the 70s, you know, before I was at university age, in the 70s for sure, um, there were some British campuses that were extremely hostile um, to all things Israel. And it kind of ebbs and flows. Um, and I, and there was the, in the previous hour, there was somebody from McGill. I, I think I went to McGill. It might have been Concordia, um, which was was pretty unpleasant 
you know, 20, 30 years ago. And, and you know, it's the, it's the unwillingness to air the debate that is so, um, <laughs> so undemocratic. It's so uh, um, skewed. The, the, the refusal to have people air arguments that you think might be problematic or that you don't want, you don't want to agree with or you're not going to agree with is, is really it's, it's the opposite of what a university environment is supposed to be. And it was, it was ever such. Uh, this sounds like it's a really difficult period. Um, so I, I commend people who are, who are standing up for Israel, which deserves standing up for. That doesn't mean that everything it does is, is, is right. Um, but broadly speaking, I think the more you understand Israel and the more you uh, know about Israel and all of its challenges and all of its flaws, the more you empathize with it. And for all, all the people on this call who are interested in, um, in, in opinion pieces and, and more broadly in journalism, um, and everybody else is on this call as well, you know, come to Israel. Uh, the best uh, source of information and understanding is firsthand. The best writing is writing that comes from personal conviction, from personal experience. Um, I'll, I'll just tell you a little story, which is not so many years ago, I spoke to a group who'd come to Israel from South Africa and they were veteran apartheid, anti-apartheid activists, uh, diplomats, journalists, uh, academics. And it was kind of a high risk mission by the South African Zionist Federation because there was the possibility that um, these quite influential people um, would come back from Israel and say it's everything that the bad reports tell us that it's you know it's a terrible country and we should not be having anything to do with it. Um, they'd never organized a trip like this before, and I, I spoke to them on the final day of their trip, and they were so empathetic to Israel that I worried for them when they went home. I worried that they would lose their credibility, and I was saying things to them. Hey, but you, you know, you visited settlements, right? And you spoke to Palestinian leaders, right? And I won't tell you the specifics of what they said, but yeah, they'd had a, a, a genuinely diverse trip. They'd seen um, pretty much, you know, all the key places that needed to be seen to get a fair sense of what was going on. And they were extremely empathetic to Israel. And that was not a, a dead cert by any means. And therefore, you know, it's... Um, it's the Middle East. It's a pretty dangerous environment. And yet all of you have been to Israel will know when you fly to Israel, somehow we've created a sense of a cocoon to a large extent. And you kind of forget you're in a pretty treacherous neighborhood. And Israel has some magic that it works. Again, it is not without flaws. And it's even entering a pretty difficult period politically, potentially right now. The security challenges are endless. You know all this. Uh, right. But if, if this is something that you take seriously, and if this is something that people on the call want to do, the more, t the more you understand about Israel, the more you know and have seen for yourself, the more effective you will be. First of all, you'll formulate a view on Israel and views on Israel, you know, <laughs> solidarity with Israel and support for Israel can vary. It can be you know, the kind of Israel that you, that, you, that you want to see. But the more you see, the more you understand, the more you have firsthand, the more effective an advocate you'll be. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, just a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, and we want to, you know, just make sure these get answered as quickly as possible. Um, you know, for the for the sake of everybody's time this weekend, we really appreciate you being here and, um, you know, just sharing your thoughts. I mean, so much insight, um, so much inspiration. Um, so my first question is uh, from our audience is, David, based on what you've heard today, what advice do you have for college students? And I think you've given a lot, but if you had to sum it up. Yeah, no, uh, look, that's, that's the question, right? So, you know, it, it, we seem to have reached a situation where saying reasonable things about Israel and Jews it requires an act of courage um, and you have to muster it and you will feel more courageous if you are empowered with information that you are secure about. Right? It's, it's very hard to stand up for a cause because you think it's right. If, you have, if you're up against people with a great deal of knowledge and a great deal of determination, right? you, you have to have knowledge yourself. You have to be on solid ground. And not only that, you have to feel comfortable in yourself about it, because otherwise, at the moments of truth, you know, you, you, you won't find you've got the strength to, to champion the things that you'd like to champion. So your, your courage in standing up for what is reasonable and right will be boosted by, by the more knowledge and confidence that you have in that knowledge. So know stuff, understand stuff, and then, you know, stand up for it. Excellent. Uh, our next question. 
Any tips for balanced writing that still gets the Jewish or pro-Israel point across? I think uh, kind of ties into that concern that you were speaking about with those journalists that you know came down to Israel that uh, had a change in sentiment. How do we how do we how do we strike that balance? Look, it's I'm I'm pleased to be on this call, and I'm pleased to be on this call because I'm somewhere in the confused middle ground of Israeli politics. Um, I um, and I write all the time, so you can judge what I stand for. And I run a publication where we are um, criticized across the spectrum from left and from right in Israeli political terms. And I consider that to be a necessary but not sufficient condition. In other words, if we we're only getting bashed from one side, I'd know we were doing something wrong. And the fact that we're getting bashed from every side doesn't necessarily prove that we're doing everything right. We, we try to cover Israel fairly. The, the, the website is called the Times of Israel. You know, it's it believes in Israel. It wants Israel to thrive. Um, and we try to do decent journalism. By the way, we get stuff wrong. Uh, we try not to. We have a blogs platform that many of you know and many of you write on, actually, that is, you know, very, very diverse and goes to the heart of everything that we've talked about. Right. Because it does present people with contradictory, inconveniently contradictory narratives and notions. And I, I think it's really important. Now, in op ed pieces, it is you're trying to make a point, right? You're not really trying to make points for the people you disagree with. But there are, you know, there are cases where your argument is strengthened by allowing, you know, there's some there's a, there's a certain degree of legitimacy to this argument. However, you know, that's sometimes can help your argument hold sway. People who are relentlessly defensive and deaf to other arguments you know, don't usually win a great deal of support. And again, that's the context in which we're, we're speaking. We're speaking about moves to shut down contradictory arguments. So sometimes allowing, you know what, I'm not saying that there isn't some merit in that argument, but I think this is a much more powerful point to make. That can be an effective way of, of conveying your point as well. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, David. Uh, we really appreciate, again, you taking the time to join us today. Um, I mean, just a great, great afternoon. Um, this is right. This is my passion. This is what I love to do. And I know many of the students are also very much, uh, you know, passionate and dedicated to this cause. And the fact that you took time to to be with us today and and, uh, and to give us some wisdom, I mean, uh, definitely taking it to heart, uh, taking it to mind and putting it to action. And so back to combat anti-Semitism. I think you might be. Uh, Thank you so much again, David and Douglas. We really do appreciate your insights and your words today. Um, I also want to thank Aviva Rosenschein, as well as Barney Breen Portnoy, and of course, all the students for being with us. Um, as we move through this, we really want to say the following. Um, all of this talk and, and all the discussion today is only as helpful as the actions that we know students have the opportunity to take moving forward. I have the pleasure of again announcing the launch of a new campus media contest organized by the Combat Anti-Semitism Movement, Cameron Campus, ACT-IL, Hasbro Fellowships, and the TIFA Fund. Uh, students are invited to submit articles to be reviewed by a selection committee on a rolling basis over the course of the fall semester. And the committee will provide feedback uh, before you seek media publication. Articles may again cover a range of topics from speaking out against anti-Semitism to sharing a personal story about your connection to Israel uh, and refuting anti-Zionist propaganda. Entrants whose articles are approved by the committee will receive $100 articles approved that are then published by non-campus media outlets will receive $250 in approved articles that are published by campus media outlets will merit a total award of $350. Select articles may be republished on CAM's website and the Camera on Campus blog. For more information and to submit your articles, please do visit campusmedia.combatantisemitism.org. We look forward to reading the impactful work we are sure you will all produce. This now concludes today's program. Thank you and good luck. <laughs>